Now what I want to talk about in this video will apply to any clinical situation you might find yourself in, or indeed any first aid situation you might find yourself in. And it's about how we give priority to various aspects of care. Prioritization of care. And the principles we use here are A, B, C, D and E just the first five letters of the alphabet. Now, now why it so happens that these immensely useful clinical principles just fit into the first five letters of the alphabet, I've no idea, but that they do. So let's start off with thinking about the first one, which is airway. Absolutely vital that the airway is patent. The airway has to be open so the air can go in and out. And very often we just assess this by talking to our patient. If the patient can talk to us, then by definition that means the airway is clear because the vocal cords are, are in the airway. So if the vocal cords are vibrating, generating the patient's speech, then air is going through them and the patient has a patent airway, then we can move on. But other times we're not so sure. And in this situation we need to look, listen and feel. So we look for the patient of the movement, the, the movement of the patient's chest. We look for the movement of the patient's abdomen to see if we've got normal ventilatory movements. And if we're not sure, we can go closer. And what I normally do first is put my hand over the patient's mouth and nose. And it's very reassuring if you feel the patient exhaling on your hand. But if we're not sure we can go closer, we can put our ear on or near the patient's nose and we can look down over the line of the patient's chest and abdomen and we can look for movements from that angle. And at the same time, if there's any breath, we can feel it on our ear because the ear is very sensitive. And we can also hear it if there's anything. If the air's going in and out, we can hear that with our ear. So we need to assess this, look, listen and feel. Because if the airway is blocked, the oxygen is not getting into the patient's body, they'll become severely hypoxic. And if the airway is fully blocked, they'll become unconscious within a few minutes. Uh, shortly after that, they'll get brain damage and damage to the heart, particularly the heart muscle, the myocardium. And shortly after that, they're going to die. I mean, it, it's said that oxygen lack first stops the machinery, then wrecks the machine. So first it will stop the brain from working, but then it will go on and irrevocably, irrevocably damage the brain. Permanent brain damage will occur. We call it hypoxic brain injury. So vital that we keep the airway open. And in emergency situations, if the patient's hypoxic, then that's going to uh, cause hypoxia of the myocardium and that's going to make the myocardium more irritable and it won't respond to our resuscitation attempts. It's sometimes said that blue hearts don't start. Which brings us on to another interesting point, cyanosis. Hypoxia will cause cyanosis or hypoxemia will cause cyanosis. So hypoxemia is the lack of oxygen in the blood and that's going to mean the blood becomes darker red. But the strange thing is when this dark red blood is seen through human skin and human mucous membranes it gives a blue tint. So cyanosis indicates low levels of oxygen as well. Another important clinical observation. Now if the patient's airway is not open we need to open it, especially with a reduced level of consciousness. Now what is the most common thing that blocks the airway in an unconscious patient. What is the most common cause of airway obstruction? Well, the most common cause of airway obstruction is the patient's own tongue, it falls back. So what we need to do is extend the neck and that pulls the tongue forward and that opens the airway. And normally that will open the airway. We reassess, we look, listen and feel and hopefully we will then see the chest movements, feel the air on our hand or ear and, and hear the patient breathing. That will restore it by opening the airway. Now the exception to this is a patient with trauma of the upper chest, uh, neck or head. If they're unconscious and can't talk to us then we have to assume they have a cervical spine injury. And if we move the neck 
to extend it, we can move the broken vertebrae and that can transect the spinal cord and that can turn a serious injury into a catastrophic injury. This is just unthinkable, we never want this to happen. So in that case we would use the jaw thrust manoeuvre. And here the fingers go behind the angle of the patient's jaw and you pull the jaw forward so the patient's bottom teeth are sticking over the patient's top teeth and that also pulls the pulls the uh, tongue forward and out of the way of the oropharynx so we can open the airway and at this stage in the hospital situation we would certainly give uh, high concentrations of oxygen as soon as that was available now people do worry about oxygen sometimes but giving healthy people high concentrations of oxygen for short periods of time is absolutely safe. Now I know some people are what we call carbon dioxide retainers and um, that th they often can stop breathing if we give them too much oxygen but it's important to remember these patients will still die through lack of oxygen the same as anyone else. So in emergency situations we tend to just put high levels of oxygen on, on everyone. So that's uh, A for airway. Moving on now to B for breathing. And of course, this is, this is just an integral part of every clinical assessment, isn't it? We, we assess the rate of breathing, so we know the patient's respiratory rate. If it's too high, that's tachypnea. If it's too low, that's bradypnea. We want, we want the rate to be between, we say, 12 and, and 20, we accept as normal. And we would also examine the, uh, assess the rhythm of breathing. It is there a regular rhythm to the breathing? And at this stage, we can also take the patient's oxygen saturations on a finger or on a ear. <coughs> if the periphery is shut down, use a, use a central point is often better. And we would assess their oxygen saturations. And we certainly want those to be above 94%. And we're also listening at this stage, so um, partial obstruction, for, the, for example, of the upper airway will call what we call stridor, where we can hear the air going past an obstruction. Of course, if there's complete blockage of the airway, there's going to be no sounds at all, but we can hear this stridor sometimes, obstruction of the upper airway. Or if there is bronchoconstriction in the lower airways, that usually gives rise to a, a wheezy sound, so we can listen to that, and it gives us a lot of clinical information. We can also percuss the chest, we can listen with a, with a stethoscope. And another quick test, especially in trauma, is just make sure that the uh, trachea is central. Because if the trachea is deviated, that can indicate pressure. So, for example, if a patient had a tension pneumothorax after an injury, on the right side of the chest, that would push the trachea across to the left, the tracheal deviation, very quick and easy to test for. Now in some clinical situations we can improve the patient's breathing just by sitting them up. Patients uh, breathe better when they're sitting up. In other more emergency type situations, if the patient's not breathing, then we need to breathe for them. Now normally the diaphragm goes down, the ribs and intercostal muscles goes up and out, that increases the volume of the chest, that reduces the pressure, and air is sucked in. We are negative pressure ventilators. But if a patient can't do that for themselves for some reason, then we can breathe for them by blowing air in. This is called positive pressure ventilation, intermittent positive pressure ventilation. And here in a hospital situation, we'd use a bag valve mask, and we'd probably use airway adjuncts. An airway adjunct is just anything they use to help you with the airway. So we might use an oropharyngeal airway or a nasal airway or an eye gel or possibly even endotracheal intubation. In first aid situations, you might just need to use mouth to mouth ventilation. But the principle is the same. We are using external pressure to blow air into the patient's lungs. So we have breathing. Now, if you say to a patient, uh, are your A and B satisfactory? And they say, I don't know what you're talking about. Th then by definition, that means that their A and B are OK, because <laughs> the, the, as we've said, the vocal cords are in the airway and they're breathing to facilitate, uh, to facilitate speech. So going on to C, C stands for circulation. And again, this is just intrinsic to all of our clinical 
observations and assessments. So what is the patient's heart rate? What is their pulse doing? And learn to palpate peripheral pulses. And also learn to palpate central pulses. Because if the patient is in an emergency situation and their blood pressure is low, then the peripheral pulses will go. So remember, when the blood pressure is low, the peripheral pulses go. So learn to palpate the carotid and the femoral pulses as well. Use your machines by all means, but there's no substitute for, for palpating the pulse. And of course, do the patient's blood pressure and test their capillary refill time as part of the assessment of circulation. So we press the fingernail beds for five seconds and we want them to go pink again in under two seconds. But sometimes if the patient's peripherally shut down, we can do what we call a central, uh, a central capillary refill time and do it on the... I normally press over the sternum and uh, watch the capillaries reperfuse after five seconds of pressure heart rate, blood pressure. We can also assess the, the heart rhythm if we've got the, uh, the relevant equipment with us at this stage. Now D stands for disability. Now if your nervous system's not working, that's going to cause disability. So D for disability is really about our assessment of the nervous system. And of course, there's many ways we can do this. But to start off with, we can use these principles of GAP, the GAP principles to assess D for disability for nervous system. Now, G is for glucose, because if the patient's hypoglycemic, they'll be unconscious. Make no mistake, hypoglycemia causes unconsciousness and will cause death if we don't recognize it. So at this stage, we check for uh, glucose. And AVPU is, is the patient alert? Are they responsive to voice? Are they responsive to pain? Or are they unresponsive? That's the AVPU score. And that gives us a very rough indication of the patient's LOC, their level of consciousness. If more time was available, of course, we can do a full Glasgow Coma Scale assessment, looking for a normal level of consciousness of, of 15 and another quick and easy test is the pupils. Just shine a light in the pupils and both equals should constrict briskly when we shine a light in them and they should be completely equal. If they're not, then there could well be something going on inside the, inside the cranial cavity. For example, if there's a bleed in the right side of the cranial cavity, that can cause a dilated and sluggish right pupil. But do be careful because a minority of people do have unequal pupils anyway for, for other reasons. And also at this stage we could test for uh, lateralizing signs. So do the hands have equal power? Do the arms have equal power? Are the legs moving equally? To make sure that the, the motor function on both sides of the body is equal. Because if it's not that's what we call lateralizing signs. So for example if there was an intracranial bleed on the right side that could cause weakness in the uh, left arm and the left leg. So that's D for disability. Exposure. Now we certainly don't want to expose our patients all the time, but in, in a trauma situation especially, we need to inspect all of the patients of the surface, uh, all the surface of the patient's body. So do maintain their dignity, do get chaperoned if you feel that's appropriate, but the, the patient's whole body needs to be, needs to be examined in exposure. And I've made up a couple of other things for E as well. Uh, environment. So we need to maintain a, a private environment, certainly when the patient is being exposed. Patient dignity must be maintained at all times. It really is not negotiable. And also it's important to think about the temperature. For example, if a patient has internal bleeding and the environment is cold, the patient's body temperature can drop and that will reduce the coagulability of the blood because blood clots best at 37 degrees centigrade because it's all based on enzymes. So when the uh, body temperature is low, the blood will flow. We have to maintain adequate body temperature, adequate environment. So think about the environment, make it as comfortable and therapeutic as possible. And, and, and if you want, E can stand for everything else as well. <laughs> we will go on to what we call the secondary survey. <laughs>
So this, uh, this A, B, C, D, uh, E really is what we call the primary survey. We can then go on to a much more detailed head to toe examination of the patient if that is, is appropriate. Now, treat life threatening um, problems first before moving on to the next. So we assess the airway and we make sure the airway is patent before we go on to B. Then we make sure the patient's breathing adequately before we go on to C. So if interventions are needed to make sure the patient is breathing properly, we would do that before we go on to C. So these things are assessed and treated as we find them in sequential order. It's not like we look for we assess A, B, C, D and E and then go back and treat A. No, we assess A then we treat A, we assess B then we treat B, we assess C then we treat C. The other things I'm afraid just have to wait. And of course we need to assess the effects of the treatment. We do this in everyday life don't we? We try something and we say well has that worked then? So we need to make sure that when we open the airway it is opened that when we are assessing, when we're treating the patient's breathing, that, that we are in fact ventilating the lungs effectively. We need to assess the effects of our, of our treatment. If we're assessing, if we've assessed C and we find the patient has no circulation, then we need to carry out chest compressions, but we need to assess that these are working properly as much as we can. So assess the effects of treatment. Now, we never need to keep uh, clinical, <laughs> clinical situations secret from our, from our colleagues, especially in emergency situations. So as soon as we're unhappy, call for appropriate help early. Now I've called for help on many occasions and often I've needed that help. <laughs> but other times I've shouted for help and it turns out it wasn't such a big deal. After all, I didn't really need that help. And likewise, many times people have said, can you help me please? And I've ran into a cubicle. And it turns out that sometimes they don't need help. It was just a bit of a false alarm. Well, that's absolutely fine. I'd rather be called 999 times when it was unnecessary than, than someone missed that one time when they really did need help. So feel free to take a second opinion. Feel free to call for help anytime you, you, you are remotely uncertain. But certainly in emergency situations, call for help at, at the earlier stage. Anytime you're remotely uncertain, call for help. This is a team effort. Now, in trauma, the ATLS guidelines are slightly different. So, well, they're the same really, but we'll talk about airway with cervical spine control. So in trauma, rather than just saying airway, say airway with C-spine control. The two just go together. Breathing with ventilation, the two just go together again. And in, a, in trauma, circulation with hemorrhage control. So the hemorrhage control comes under C. But there is an exception to this. Now, military people, uh, medical people, have been uncomfortable for some time with the ABC. And this was formalised in the Gulf War, in, in uh, first Gulf War in 1991 where these principles were uh, agreed by the British military and all militaries. Um, C, A, B, C is the priority. So sometimes C takes priority over A. And C stands for catastrophic hemorrhage. So if uh, some soldiers might be walking along and one of them steps on a landmine and sustains a horrendous injury, a leg's blown off. Just, just unimaginable levels of violence and trauma. But it happens. And there, the, we were, there were healthy seconds before, so their airway breathing's okay. The, the, the problem is the, they've got catastrophic uh, blood loss. So that would be addressed first, probably by arterial clamping, by tourniquets, by direct pressure. So in some situations, uh, catastrophic hemorrhage is dealt with first, then we go on to airway breathing circulation. That's the only exception I can think of to the A, B, C, D, E priority of care if there's catastrophic hemorrhage. Complete an initial assessment and reassess regularly. So this is not a one-off process. It's not that we say, well, I've checked A, B, C, D, E. I'm now going for a cup of tea now. No, no. We need to constantly monitor and reassess. 
For example, we might assess that the patient's airway is patent in a patient with low levels of consciousness, but then they vomit and then the airway is not patent. They can obstruct the airway by inhaling vomit and they can get aspiration pneumonia. So, so we need to constantly reassess or a patient might be breathing satisfactorily at one stage, then they get a severe allergic reaction and bronchoconstriction, for example, and, and then of course they're not breathing. We need to constantly reassess this. It's not a one-off process. It's an ongoing assessment process. So we assess, we intervene, we reassess, an ongoing process. And as we reassess, we assess the effectiveness of our intervention. Now, of course, if you've got a team with you, that's, that's wonderful. If we've got a trauma coming in in, in the A&E situation, we'll have a, an airway person, a breathing person, a circulation person, and they've got, all got assigned roles, and that can all be done simultaneously if we're in a team situation. So that's nice, because A is still being dealt with immediately, but at the same time, uh, people are simultaneously dealing with, with other problems in a severely traumatised patient. If we have a team, that's wonderful. Communicate effectively using the situation background assessment recommendations. Again, these were developed by the military. I think this was developed by the, the American uh, Navy, but it works very well. So um, I might go to my consultant and say, the situation is Mr. Smith in cubicle one has gone into cardiac arrest. I think he's got ventricular fibrillation. The background is that he came in with chest pain, suspected myocardial infarction. I was just doing the 12 lead and he went into ventricular fibrillation. So my assessment is we're in a cardiac arrest situation, ventricular fibrillation. My recommendation is that basic life support is carried on and that advanced life support is indicated. Although, of course, the consultant should know that, but feel free to recommend it anyway. So, no, it really works. This S bar, if you go through that, it works and we get clear communication. There's been so many catastrophic things have gone wrong in healthcare through simple lack of communication. And this S bar really does help. I think it's a great tool. So, there we are A, B, C, D, and E.